Run, river, run, run through the hills. Run, river, run to the sea. Run, river, run to your place beneath the sun. Run, river, run over me. Run through the land, you run through my soul. Bring me wisdom and peace. Run through all ages. Welcome to be my guest today. We have candidate for state representative Sean Craig. Welcome, Sean. Thank you very and much for having Sean me. Sean is a, is a uh, resident here in Upton, and he has high hopes for becoming state representative. The election is when exactly, Sean? Well, I have a primary. The primary is on September 9th. September 9th. Yes. Okay. So listen up. Now, we have all the different things that he sent me that he is very, very enthusiastic about. Ah, okay. First of all, a little bit about you. Semper Fi, he was in the Marine Corps. Oh, yes. And you went to, when did you go to school? When did I go? Where did you go? Did you go around here and <clears throat> did you graduate here? No, actually, uh, I'm originally from Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had, uh, I'm originally from Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, it's the largest naval base in the world. Uh, that's probably what, you know, part of me, part, part of what drew me to the Marine Corps probably rather than the Navy. Uh, just being around the Navy all the time. Uh, no, I ended up actually at a, a small private school out in the mountains of Virginia, uh, right between the Appalachian and Blue Ridge Mountains called Rono College. I've never heard of it. No, it's uh, actually, it's, it's funny, it's actually probably about, uh, probably a good 40% of their student body is actually from the Northeast. Really? Yes, and I think behind Virginia, Massachusetts is the next highest. What did you major in? I double majored, international relations and business. Uh, I actually started with a minor as well, mm -hmm. high hopes, yeah. once again. I uh, finally decided after a couple of years that uh, maybe I should concentrate more on two things rather than three. Yeah. Uh, but I uh, managed to graduate early, graduated before I was 21. Uh, so three and a half years, uh, two, two majors. I, uh, I also did in, end up getting a master's degree in finance. Uh, I got that up here in Boston. Mm -hmm. I've been in Boston for about 10 years now. That is excellent. Anybody who can crunch the numbers, <laughs> 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 you can help me, all right? Okay. Now, Sean has a family. You live here in Upton. You yes. are an entrepreneur. He has his own business. Yes. And what made you decide to write for, run for state rep? You know, it, it's interesting. I, I actually... Uh, so I got an email one morning from my wife. Uh, my wife's actually a CPA, works for a uh, major law firm in Boston, and uh, she saw an article that George Peterson was going to be retiring. Yeah. And she sent that article over to me, and, and in so many words, and in a phone call later, uh, told me that, you know, you're always raising your hand for everything under the sun. Uh, you like being involved in things, mm -hmm. and uh, this is probably the best time for you to do it. And, you know, with her blessing, uh, made that decision. So I tested the waters for a little bit and then made my announcement. How long ago? How long ago? Did you count the months since you made your decision? <laughs> it must seem like a long time or a short time. I, I, I think uh, fairly early, uh, really in February, I already knew that I was going to be doing it. You knew it. Yeah. It's something you can tell that you really are enthusiastic about. Oh, absolutely. It's, oh, yeah. uh, it's you know, something that I grew up around, yeah. actually. Um, you know, the, uh, my formative years, I would say, uh, really were in the late 70s and uh, early 80s. And I uh, spent a lot of that time with my paternal grandparents, uh, whether or not that was <clears throat> on weekends or coming home after school, going, going there uh, for a little bit before going you know, to my actual home later in the evening, yeah. we picked up. And uh, I saw community service. Uh, yeah, my my uh, grandmother had a uh, Master's of Fine Arts. She was a docent at the local museum. She was you know, involved in the women's club. My grandfather was an entrepreneur. Uh, it started a business that my father continued that I was uh, originally expected to continue. Yep, things and, changed. And, 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 did, and did for a little bit, actually, <laughs> as well, and have been part of here and there over the years. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he was very involved uh, politically as well. Uh, he was a delegate in 1960 presidential convention mm -hmm. uh, for Virginia, and uh, he also made his own run for mayor at the nomination uh, down there. And so he was very involved as well. And uh, so just kind of having, having that around me, yeah. Uh, really taught me quite a bit about service. Mm -hmm. And so that's been uh, something that I, and, and I would say actually I learned a good lesson coming out of college. Uh, coming out of college, I actually became a stockbroker in DC for a brief period of time. Got you were a stockbroker? I got my securities licenses uh, right out of school. Uh, so I got my licenses in, in 96 and um, uh, was sponsored at that time in 96 and, and worked until probably about December of 97. That's stressful work. 
It was. It was before the dot com uh, yeah. bubble. Uh, Were you on the floor of the stock exchange? No, no. This this was uh, yeah, this was in DC, yeah. uh, a brokerage firm, very much uh, it's sort of your boiler room. I would actually uh, oh. consider. Yeah, some of the movies you've seen out there, uh, perhaps not that sketchy, but uh, it, you know, it was there. Uh, and this and this again is the time that uh, this is before they converted over to the, the decimal system, even in the pricing when you look at you know, look in the journal or such. Uh, and it was very much like throwing. Uh, throwing darts, and you could anything you wanted to say on the Wall Street Journal, any, everything seemed to be going up, and people mm -hmm. were out there almost like betting the betting on the races. Yeah, yeah. Um, and say, sure, you have five thousand, I'll try you out. And then a few weeks later, they'd be going and trying <laughs> yeah. somebody. Maybe three or four brokers at the same time, yeah. maybe a, a discount broker. Discount brokers is a big thing back then. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it was an interesting interesting time uh, to be involved uh, in that. Uh, but it's probably the it's really the first brush I had with. Um, uh, unsuitable investments mm. uh, with what I consider sort of misrepresentation and really not looking out for the customer. Mm. Uh, and and that was just some of the sale, sales tactics that were being used at the time and such and just kind of the pressure on sales. Uh, and I, I really just, uh, I got to see sort of the under, underbelly of the beast. And for somebody who you know, was so young, coming right out yeah, of school, yeah. and that to be really your first First actual job, and I thought this was going to be the career for several years. Right. Uh, it really you know, dissuaded me, and uh, I left. And I ended up actually uh, deciding to go into the Marine Corps. <laughs> what a, a little bit of a, a little yeah. bit of a difference. Oh yeah, and you took to that though. I did, I did. Yeah. Um, I, I, I did enjoy you know parts of that, uh, and uh, however you know later on I did have a, a bit of transitional period there as well as I was going. I, I did end up in the family business and real estate. Uh, I did have my sales license. I did have. I, I was actually conducting residential appraiser, appraisals yeah. uh, on houses, uh, both conventional FHA, VA. Mm. Uh, did VA property management. Something that I grew up around. You know, yeah. there wasn't there wasn't a weekend or afternoon probably or, or just a day in the summer growing up that I wasn't being sent to the courthouse to look at you know plot books and. Uh, uh, poor deeds and, and things of that nature. Right. Um, sort of a jack of all trades. Very young. So I, I did. I, I was, but it was, uh, it was, it was logical at that time. As that transition, I knew I was going to the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. and it was just a matter of time for that processing and being able to go. And so I stepped into that. And uh, briefly, when I came out, I stepped into that again. Uh, however, you know, I, I also knew uh, that I wanted my own thing. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that you know I saw my father take over my grandfather's business. Uh, he changed a little bit from more of the commercial side of real estate to more of a residential perspective, appraising more so than sales and development. Uh, and I had my own ideas. Uh, but at the same time, I really wanted to do my own thing. And, and real estate has continued to be a, uh, a passion of mine. Oh, I love real estate. Uh, I, I would say, though, I, I, I'm far more interested in uh, the securitization. The numbers part estate. of it, right? The numbers. Yes. I want to go see the houses. <laughs> so I, look, I, I, I like the idea of you know how do you how do you buy the mall? Yeah. And how do you get investors into that? Or uh, you know sky rises and such, and using REITs, so you know public not traded REITs or uh, tenants in commons, and it's just more complex type securities than yeah. that. I find very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, but you know I, I would say that uh, I'll just kind of give you a little more of the background. I I, I uh, uh, came back and. Uh, Ended up actually going into financial planning, so I returned to the financial services industry yeah. uh, somewhat reluctantly. I, I, I turned down several positions up front uh, in large cities, and it was mainly because there was that high pressure, uh, that sense of you have to have so much volume and so much you know, sales mm -hmm. by X amount of time. Sure. And um, it, it, again, it just it brought that kind of heart back to those, those feelings I had initially. Uh, until I found something out in the mountains, actually, uh, where I had gone to school. Where in Virginia? Mine, in, in Virginia, in the mountains. And uh, I ended up going out there. It was a much more relaxed pace, mm -hmm. uh, willing to really kind of take the time and develop. Yeah. Uh, and I found myself very quickly on a management track. Uh, so within only a year, and this was um, you know, perhaps maybe about you know, 26 years old or so, I was uh, you know, running classes, you know, going into interviews uh, for people. I was uh, doing classes each week on different sort of investment products, on sales, on gathering data, uh, even uh, emotional competency classes. You grew up fast. <laughs> uh, so I had, had a number of things I was involved with. And unfortunately, yeah. um, that, that specific uh, firm or that office uh, was going to be closed. Yeah. It was a pilot office for a long time, but it was to be closed. And, uh, 
you know, I concentrated really on uh, teachers, uh, single moms, uh, and uh, a lot of a lot of teachers, a lot of retired teachers, in fact, living mm -hmm. on fixed incomes, and uh, and also just uh, young families with uh, children looking at college, college education, mm -hmm. and I had to basically find another another area to go, yeah. and uh, it was either to choose the track, and I had many people, so I was the analyst. That was that was my thing. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed much more of that than the sales, and so I had so many people actually come to me and say, "Look, we're interested in." Going out, we're going to <clears throat> do our own roof over the head, and uh, you know the four of us will go out there and bring people in, and we want you to just do all the plans for us and, and all the products, and you know, work this all out for us. And uh, I, I've kept up with those people. It probably would have been a very lucrative business to, to do that. Uh, I had interest though in uh, continuing with the management track, and so I ended up moving. Uh, so I had a very short period back to Virginia Beach and the Norfolk area, uh, and then only within. Uh, so that's about a span, a little over three years, uh, that uh, I ended up ended up in Virginia Beach, and immediately, and as I got there, within about a year, I was called active duty uh, in the reserve. Uh, I was with the uh, reserve unit of Quantico, Virginia, uh, Marine Corps Base Quantico. Uh, I was a Marine NCO with a light armor reconnaissance uh, unit that was up there, and it's it's probably. Uh, the easiest, easiest way to explain that, and I, I talk to people, is if you think back to the westerns you see on, on Sundays in the yeah. afternoon, and you mm -hmm. see the, the cavalry goes out, and sees the mountain, or sees, sees the canyon, yeah. and uh, they say, scout up. Mm -hmm. Go over that mountain, go into that canyon, see if anybody's waiting for us on the other side. And you did that. And that was my job. Now, how did you get, when did you move here to New England? I, I went to Iraq. Uh, so I got called up, and I, I lost that business. So yeah. I lost three years, and about... 150 plus or minus clients at the time. I was finally getting a referral side. And uh, so that was really the second, if not almost third time of starting out again. Yeah. Ended up in Iraq uh, as part of the initial invasion uh, in 2003. And upon the return, um, uh, it took a, a period of kind of acclimation, first off, being back stateside. Yeah. Um, and, and again, found myself very reluctant to want to start over again mm -hmm. within financial services. You wanted to go forward with something new. I, I looked into everything from uh, going back, staying, uh, going in active duty, uh, the Marine Corps, and uh, I looked at uh, human source intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, which is, is in essence the boots on the ground, the you know two mm -hmm. two guys that go go in and actually live with the tribe, for instance, yeah. or the, you know, the area. Uh, I had gone through the entire process of that, I went through the entire process of the FBI. Really thought about the. You know, mm -hmm. I always enjoy wearing the white hat. Yeah. And that's how I felt as a, uh, as a Marine, as a financial planner, and helping people. And uh, I wanted to continue that yeah. uh, when I came back. And uh, eventually, I, uh, I did start, I, I did get a call and ended up uh, working again in financial services briefly. And my heart just wasn't in it. Yeah. And it was about that time, and thankfully very, very shortly in, that I got a call from what is now, now the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, mm -hmm. which is sort of the industry watchdog in the securities industry for brokerages. And they gave me a call, and uh, you know, within a couple of days I was in Maryland uh, through training uh, up there for a few months. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there I had, a, I had a choice. Do I want to go to Los Angeles or mm -hmm. do I want to go to Boston? Boston. And I, Boston, and that's what you did. immediately I was a history buff. I always thought yeah. that I'd be doing graduate studies up here. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I moved here 10 years ago this yeah. year. And you, when we heard that George Peterson was resigning, yes. you, I think your wife, you said, was the one that yes. said, hey. Yes. And she was very pro for you. Right. And you said, you know what? I think I want to do this. It it uh, it was, you know, and it's something that I even brought up uh, when I met her. Uh, you know, we met. Yeah. Uh, 2007. You met George I, Peterson. No, so I, I met uh, met my wife, yeah. uh, my mid 30s. I, I met her uh, in the Boston Harbor, oh, actually, okay. and um, you know, we met. And and during that dating, I told her, you know, I always had an interest in serving. Uh, and it, it wasn't necessarily that. You know, there was a period I lived in Quincy, and I was involved with the Friends of Faxon Park, with the, yeah. the master planning of this park and open space. So she thought this was great and was all for it. She was a bit nervous. She, she was, was she a bit yet? nervous. Initially, when you think of politics, you think, oh my goodness, you know, you think of U.S. Congress and yeah. the, the family goes in the limelight, and what are they going to find? And, but uh, you know, she's, she's uh, been following much more of the politics in the last few years, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the Brown or the Gomez, Markey, and such. And mm -hmm. she kept on bringing it up to me, little hints here and yeah. there. And, uh, you know, I did so much travel, too, yeah. you know, when I was doing this. I was a 
investigate the U.S. securities markets, you know, for almost 10 years. And so I was going after fraud, money laundering, embezzlement, uh, Ponzi schemes and such. Oh, yeah. And I uh, yeah, had been travel. doing this. And uh, so I did a lot of travel. Yeah. And so part of it was, you know, I would, would like to be more here than always on the road. Yeah. And uh, so it was several yeah. things. And we bought our house here. Yeah. And I uh, immediately got involved um, on the finance committee uh, in Upton. I was just recently reappointed uh, to the FinCom. I am the current liaison to the Minden Upton uh, School District, mm -hmm. uh, so I attend all the, the budget subcommittee meetings and such, and uh, here and there may be a, a school committee meeting, yeah. uh, or I can catch it online you know, through the streaming. Um, and I'm also vice chair of the Minden Upton Multiboard, uh, which is a group, uh, for those that, that don't know, is the group of selectmen, uh, FinCon members, and school committee from both towns of Minden and Upton. And it's really an open line of communication and trying to uh, figure out ways uh, that we can reduce costs while sustaining or improving services. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a perfect example from just this last, these last few months uh, is the trash collection, looking at the trash and recycling. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, every, uh, mm -hmm. each, each group, the, uh, the town as well as the, the schools had different contracts. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that several of them were coming up around the same time, and so we managed to bundle a few of those and save several thousand dollars. And that's really, again, just through good communication. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's, that's sort of my involvement. I've been involved in the men's club here in town, which oh, was part of the fireworks yeah, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, we do the senior dinners uh, you know, every, every month, except for the summer, yeah. uh, which is always a big hit. Now I have a list. Yes, I'm waiting, oh. I'm waiting for you here. Just, you just, said just, this let to me, just let me go. And, All right, see now, so, you sent this to me. <laughs> yes, okay. yes. All right. You are the area coordinator to repeal indexed gas tax. Yes, that is true. Um, last year, uh, the, the state legislature uh, decided to increase gas taxes by about three cents, but at the same time decided to index it in the future to inflation, the CPI, mm -hmm. or Consumer Price Index. And uh, in essence, this is something for, for many people that just slapped in the face of taxation without representation. Uh, that you know, we elect our officials to go up there and take a vote for us. Mm. And instead, it seems that they want to sort of abdicate this responsibility. Mm -hmm. And you, you have to understand that uh, formal session last year was only 25 days. Mm. So it's not as if they're, they have so much work they don't have time to actually take a vote yeah. on this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and certainly, you know, and I think, I think people need to understand, because it came up so often at, at, at uh, grocery stores and getting signatures uh, to try to get this on the ballot, to try to repeal this indexing. Uh, that it's specifically the indexing. Mm. Uh, we're, it's not against or, or getting rid of the tax that's there. The tax is necessary, it is needed uh, to repair roads and bridges. I mean, look at the roads just around Upton and look, yeah. going into certain areas of Northbridge and Grafton. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's a, there's a certain need there. Yeah. Uh, it's simply the indexing. We just want our elected officials to take a vote on it. Yeah. And uh, you know, so, so, so I did become involved. Last year they, they collected uh, approximately 120,000 signatures. Mm -hmm. Many of those were thrown out. Mm -hmm. And the legislature decided not to look at it. Or How can you throw out signatures? Sort of certification signatures. So can you read it? Is that person actually registered as a voter in the area? Uh, that sort of thing. Same thing that happens actually with nomination papers to get on the ballot. I thought if somebody signs something, that's a, they're signing it illegal, and you, why would you throw what somebody signs? They're saying, yeah. <laughs> oh, illegible. Uh, can, oh, can't, okay. can't read it, can't, can't tie it, tie okay. it in. Yeah. Uh, perhaps the person hasn't uh, yet registered in town. Okay, uh, I know. Yeah. Now, you are uh, transparency, accountability, you're big on that. Small business growth, which yes. I, I love. Yes. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, well, yes, yeah, small, small business growth. I, uh, so far, I'm the only candidate that's endorsed a small business bill of rights. Uh, something that exists uh, that's been put out there, uh, and, and these are certain tenets. For instance, as uh, looking at a tax, mm -hmm. and saying that if we're going to increase the tax, perhaps we should go out through different uh, geographic areas and actually you know, listen to the businesses in that area and how that tax is going to impact, or perhaps, uh, perhaps how that uh, give them time, give a, a one-year period of time, a waiting period, to figure out how you're going to pay for that tax uh, once it comes about. And it's the same thing actually with regulation. Uh, to, you, this is something that we did in the securities industry that when you, you, you come up with a guideline, you come up with a, a, a bill or a rule that's out there and you put it out to the broker dealers. In this case, you put it out to community business owners mm -hmm. to give you feedback on yeah. that. Um, and, and then from that, you're able to craft a better bill. 
and also uh, perhaps, perhaps even do a study on that to see what type of impact that's going to be. Uh, so it's, it just gives better time for businesses to decide, you know, what it's going to be, what are they going to have to do, and, and uh, I'll, I'll allow them the time to uh, yeah. to meet it. You know, it's funny. I think my father, you know, he was a, he was a corporate guy for a lot of years, and then he went off in his own small business, mm -hmm. opened a uh, business on the Cape, and he taught me it takes at least a year before you're going to see or more mm. any kind of. Basically, you can't get your hopes you're going to succeed right away. Right. I think it'd be great if couldn't we just sort of let the new businesses give them a year or two? Just is is this what you're talking about? Give them a year or two to see how they're doing, and then if they're going to succeed, then you hit them with the tag. I mean, should there be kind of a waiting period? Well, that's what I'm looking for is a one year waiting period for all businesses, just yeah. so, just yeah. so they know. Yeah. Uh, and certainly, even from looking at a federal level, you know, they, they need to know uh, what's coming down the pipe. Um, they need to know now so they can plan for it. It can't be something that continues to go and go and go and, and, and not know. And I, I will mention another thing about the, uh, the Small Business Bill of Rights. Um, and that's, that's something that I deal with on a daily basis. It's something I've done you know, over 20 years, which is act as an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, uh, a, a horrible uh, definition of independent contractor mm -hmm. or freelancer um, within the state. It's different from basically a universal definition that uh, all 49 other states have. And uh, it was changed about 10 years ago, but it really uh, prevents other industries of coming in here and hiring freelancers or independent contractors or even uh, companies here in the state. Mm -hmm. And you understand that you know, quite often um, you know, companies like the flexibility it's not just all about costing, it's also the flexibility and you're hiring somebody that has the knowledge or the skill set immediately to come in that doesn't need the training mm -hmm. in order to fit something. It could be short term, it could be a long duration. Uh, but it's really about the, you know, that flexibility that's there. And quite often with independent contractors, you also find that entrepreneurial spirit. Oh, so yeah. perhaps they want to do it and they want to do it right the first time. Sure. And unfortunately, the way that it's written is, uh, one caveat is that if, if, if a company wants to hire me, mm -hmm. say to do a specific job, and that company already has somebody in that role that does something similar to it, they, they would not be able to hire me as an independent contractor because you already employ somebody that does that. Uh, and so I would, in effect, become a, a W-2 employee. And so it sort of negates that process. And I think what you'll find with small businesses, and even for me, in looking at uh, business coming in and growing revenues, and perhaps wanting to expand or, or pick up somebody, maybe you don't have that series, that pipeline mm -hmm. of, uh, of business coming in that you can really take on that full-time employee, mm -hmm. uh, or even part-time. Maybe it's just the one-off here and there, and you'd yeah. like to start the independent contract. So it, it really does sort of uh, dampen down your prospects trying to grow that business when you can't have that flexibility to take on if you independent contractors up front. All right, another one, reform waste, fraud, and abuse yeah. in the system. Now, yes. this one, this is tough. Because you have a lot, it's like mm. when you and I were in school, all of us were in school, yes. and everyone in the classroom got punished because two right. or three messed up. Yes. Yeah. You know, you don't take it from those who need it. And right. I see where you're going, where you, but the trouble is how are you going to find out those who don't need it? That's the trouble. Well, um, I've spent a decade now dealing with waste, fraud, and abuse. As I, as I mentioned before, that was my job, whether or not it was uh, routine examinations or special investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the one that I speak quite often about is a Ponzi scheme that I found in, in Braintree. Yeah. And that person is now in federal prison for 17 years, and I made in restitution. That's not the one in Marlboro, is it? The, uh, no, this was in uh, Braintree near uh, South Shore Plaza. Okay, now were they on assistance? Oh no, this is, this is, a, this is a broker dealer. Uh, yeah. that was committing uh, uh, fraud. Right. And so it's, it's a simply a, an example of something that I've worked on in several other cases mm -hmm. where I've dealt with uh, mm -hmm. waste or fraud or abuse. Yeah, if you look at it, all you have to do is pick up a paper or turn the TV and see another example of waste or fraud in the system. If an audit, and once the audit comes out, state auditor, for instance, last year came out with a report on welfare. Mm -hmm. We have 1,164 deceased people receiving <laughs> benefits. Yeah, that's that yeah. sounds fairly clear to me. Yeah, uh, we have 15 million suspicious transactions, of which a third of that, five million uh, suspicious transactions. This is going back to like, the EBT cards. Mm -hmm. Five million that occurs in Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Florida, far, far away from here. Mm -hmm. Those are our taxpayer dollars going there. 
Yeah. Uh, so there's several areas, several items, just by looking at state audits report. And it's actually one of the committees that I'm interested in serving on mm -hmm. uh, is that, that uh, audit and oversight committee, because mm -hmm. uh, that is my background. Uh, so I think there's several areas you can look at to try to reduce uh, that waste mm -hmm. that's there, um, just as one example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there's so many families who are trying so hard. And uh, yeah. you don't know when mental illness is going to strike. You don't know when you're going to need SSDI. Mm. Versus actually, George Peterson's office was wonderful. Mm. Uh, I had somebody that needed to get on SSDI. Mm. And I think it got turned down twice. I said, enough already. Sure. So I called George's office. I got a hold of, I can't remember him back then. It was in the mid-90s, the guru of SSDI. Mm. This guy was fantastic. He walked it across in, in Worcester, got it across the street. Mm. He got it through. This went through for this person. I'd had enough. So that's what I tell a lot of people. If you're having problems with this type of thing, go to your state rep. Absolutely. And that's what they're there for. They're, they're going to understand that, you know, why are they turning this down, you know, two or three? This is nuts. Mm -hmm. And it's a game that, you know, that they, that these, that they, uh, they turn it down that they play. Absolutely. So, you know, get out well, there. You don't even have to hire a lawyer. I, I, think, I think you already hit it. That system exists. Uh, to provide economic stability to people so that they may be able to go out there and become more independent again. Uh, exactly. They can only work a certain amount. So it sort of right. cuts that. It's like you're saying, oh, yes, now we are encouraging. But then, it, you know, That's the right. line of demarcation, mm. you're, they're going, why bother? Right. If you're going to take it away from me as I make it, and it's a person is just trying to maybe mentally get back out there or physically, mm. why bother? That's right. where I think it really needs to be looked right. at, too. I think I think the area right now for me is looking at the uh, the process of being eligible for benefits. You look at illegal, illegal immigration. You look at uh, whether another person has a social security number or otherwise yes. eligible for that it. I agree. Uh, perhaps perhaps that answer and something that I'm in favor of is is putting a picture on the EBT card. Yep. Uh, that's there and actually doing an asset verification of that yeah. person's assets. That's a good thing. Uh, another example would be looking at right now uh, they're allowed to go 270 days before a letter gets sent uh, regarding any sort of funds as a balance on that EBT card, as far as being able to recoup that. Mm. And then after that, they give a 30-day 30, 30 period uh, for, for a response after that. So you're talking 300 days mm -hmm. uh, before anybody looks at this. Well, perhaps we need to peel that Probably back that to up. about a 60-day period. Yeah. Uh, perhaps also, you know, I'll, I'll leave with this as well, is that the EBT card, um, you know, again, putting the, license, putting the picture on that would be uh, quite helpful. I think that's a good thing. I go for that. I don't see any yeah. reason why a person receiving that little awful lot of people yeah. out there temporarily. I, who cares if your picture's on it? I met somebody the other day yeah. uh, while door knocking who uh, kind of, as you spoke, you know, had a need for assistance. Definitely. And uh, she had mentioned that her daughter, though, sometimes she'll allow that daughter to go and to use the EBT card. Mm -hmm. And there's some difficulty, um, uh, I, think, I think a disability that was there. And so it was, it was helpful at times that yeah. her daughter go up and, and use that. And I think that goes back to the part that always hurt in the sense of even as, a, as a, an investigator in the scooters markets, uh, is that we're creating these rules, but once again, it's that one bad apple that spoils the barrel. I know. And, and so this is somebody that's doing it. It's doing, it's, it's, Trying to do the right thing. She's being she, honest about it. There's an actual need for it. And yet, unfortunately, you have, even in that state audit's report, uh, so many cases of not even just that, but just jotting down the number that's on the card and going in and here's my number. But and you can't, the clerk you taking can't do that, can you? I thought they had to have the card. They've had, ev they've had evidence that uh, just the number has been used. How can you? I've never seen it done. Yeah, just just the number being used. There are some places that has been. Happening. But Glenn's nodding. I've never seen it done. <laughs> never. People have to get their little car. And There's so many so many little things. There was a uh, in the papers a few months back. There was a heroin addict uh, uh, nearby actually that was found with perhaps maybe 12 or 13 EBT cards in her purse. You know, so again, it, it's also that sort of underground currency. How did you get government. that many cars? Yes. Yeah, because I thought it was pretty tight. They they want mm -hmm. everything since your last hair job, right. to, you know, to get these yeah. things. Yeah. How did? <laughs> but it also, as as I said, it also allows uh, a very convenient way to do drug trafficking. <sighs> we have Sean Craig with us. <laughs> He's kind of looking for a state representative. Sean, I thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. And are you looking forward to the? Uh, the, the pre-election there coming up. I, I certainly am. You are. Yeah, I, I am the only one with uh, you know military, uh, private sector, as well as uh, you know uh, time on a committee in municipal government. 
Well, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to have you. And he's right here in Upton, too. That's great. Yes. Well, good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you next time. Run, river, run. Run through the hills. Run, river, run to the sea. Run, river, run to your place beneath the sun. Run, river, run over me. Run, river, run.